Welcome from the studios of KPBS TV in San Diego, California. We are reaching you live through a unique and complex international telecommunications network via satellite, microwave, and cable. The International Training Center at San Diego State University brings us all together in this video conference, which joins distinguished organizations located in Mexico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina, and the United States of America. Welcome to our program, the long-term organization strategizing for change in a globalized environment. This is the second video conference in the series Foundations for Prosperity in the Third Millennium. My name is Richard Page and I will be your moderator for today's program. I am the principal attorney with the Page Firm, a law firm in San Diego, practicing in the areas of business litigation and international law, including arbitration and mediation. Today's program is composed of two presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. Ten major trends will shape the world of the 21st century, transforming every facet of society and necessitating the adoption of long-term strategies for organizational success. Organizations that will prosper in the third millennium will not only recognize those trends, but will change the way they function in order to capitalize on them. In an environment of constant change and diversity, taking the long-term view is always the best strategy for creating stability and organizational success. Various authors have analyzed the dynamics of long-lived organizations such as universities or religious groups that have origins which date back to medieval times. And global corporations which are centuries old such as Sumitomo, 400 years, the East India companies, 270 years, and DuPont, 200 years. These studies have tried to identify the essential elements common to all of these enterprises finding in most cases the absence of overriding concern for maximizing short-term profits. Will this be the case also for the long-term organization of the third millennium? Will it be feasible to take the long view alone in the highly turbulent markets of the future? This futuristic video conference will address these and other issues of increasing controversy as we enter the 21st century, particularly the leadership, teamwork, and business improvement strategies that will be conducive to creating a long-term organization. The invited speakers will discuss the importance of anticipating and adapting to foreseeable trends and the importance of responsibility in the workplace. People will then become the core asset for the future learning organization that will excel in sensitivity and tolerance for change and that will depend on leaders and managers who are driven not by power but by a sense of shared authority, commitment, and the acquisition of knowledge. It is a pleasure to introduce to you today's expert speakers, Dr. Bruce Lloyd and Dr. Stephen Goldstein. Dr. Bruce Lloyd is Professor of Strategic and International Management Department at South Bank University in London, England. He also worked as a consultant for a number of international organizations. Dr. Lloyd's areas of expertise include strategic management, future studies, creating and managing new ventures, the future of offices and office work, corruption and ethics in business, and mergers and acquisitions. Dr. Lloyd has extensive journalism experience and has published his work in a number of journals, including leadership, and organizational development, business ethics, a European review, and the Leadership and Organization Development Journal. Author, lecturer, and TV personality, Dr. Stephen Goldstein, is president of Educational Marketing Services, a business that specializes in identifying and forecasting trends and in formulating strategies to capitalize on them. Developed during the past 10 years, Dr. Goldstein's consulting material on how to capitalize on the future, the technology of change, pinpoints more than 60 crucial 
demographic trends shaping America now and for the foreseeable future. Dr. Goldstein also suggests models for dealing with and implementing change. Dr. Goldstein earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Columbia University. He is a widely published author of articles and columns with unique perspectives on subjects ranging from consumer mania and politics to foreign policy and trends. His works have been published in the Los Angeles Times, the Miami Herald, the Chicago Tribune, and other leading publications which are international in scope and appeal. Dr. Goldstein's new book, 60 Trends Shaping America's Future, scheduled for publication this spring, is a comprehensive study of the forces that will affect business strategies, government policy, nonprofit organizations, and the personal lives of men, women, and children in the United States in the first decades of the 21st century. Dr. Goldstein is the host of One on One, a popular weekly TV interview program focusing on today's issues and tomorrow's trends with observations by internationally known guests. Welcome, gentlemen. Let us begin with an introductory question. With fundamental changes predicted in communications, information processing, and lifestyle, will the strongest retarding factor be human fear of change, Dr. Goldstein? In a word, yes. Uh, I do not know many people who like to change even their daily activities, so I would have to say that uh, most people are going to be dragged into the 21st century. Perhaps they'll even be dragged into the next week or month of their existence. People do not want to change. Dr. Ward? Perhaps I'm not quite so pessimistic about that because I think that most of our fear of change comes from the fact that we don't believe that it's in our interest. And that if we're involved in the management of that process to a greater extent, then it's much more likely that we will see that change will be to our benefit and that that will be something that will help the process overall. Thank you for your comments. Let us begin with Module 1, in which Dr. Lloyd will describe some secrets for success of the long-term organization. Thank you. My presentation is concerned with raising some fundamental questions about two of the most important issues in the world today. First, questions about the nature and relationship between power, responsibility, and leadership. And secondly, the whole subject of learning and its relationship to power, responsibility, and leadership. I will end with a discussion of the benefits of this integrated approach on a number of other management-related areas that influence long-term organizational success. So let me begin my analysis by considering the respective subject areas of power, responsibility and leadership and learning individually. Although the interrelationship quickly becomes apparent, it is a thesis of this approach that there is a dynamic interrelationship between these four concepts and activities and that the positive aspects of that link need to be more widely recognized. As, if the thinking outlined here is transferred into effective action by today's managers and leaders, it should enable organizations to be much more successful in the long term. There is an enormous amount of sociological literature on power, but little of this relates to the management issues associated with responsibility leadership and learning. There are many publications on leadership, but only a few of them discuss the nature and role of power, and fewer still consider the relationship between power, responsibility, and learning. There are many publications on learning, but very few of them consider the nature and role of power and its abuse, or the relationship between power, responsibility, leadership, 
and learning. There are also an increasing number of publications on ethics, but few of them consider the nature and role of power and its abuse, or the relationship between power, responsibility, and leadership. In fact, management books on leadership in general tend to be preoccupied with power, how to get it, use it, and keep it. Now the, now, the overriding objective in the approach taken here is to explore the conditions necessary to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of organizational performance. It is no, in no way intended to have either a moral or a political dimension per se. The approach is a mixture of the academic and polemic, I recognize, with the latter intended to stimulate debate on what I believe to be a most important subject. It will, however, become obvious that there is an overlap between the organizational issues and the other elements where the ideas could be potentially beneficial at both a societal and an individual level. But what is power? Charles Handy in his classic study, Understanding Organizations, considered, if we are to understand organizations, we must understand the nature of power and influence, for it is the means by which people in organizations are linked to its purpose. While Dahl, an authoritative sociologist, argued, A has power over B to the extent that they can get B to do something that B would not otherwise do. And how often do we see quotes such as, he seems to be in love with power, not just political power for the sake of getting things done or for promoting private interests, but power of status. And quotes like, they will say anything and do almost anything to hang on to power. These definitions and comments on power are typical of the management literature, and they reinforce the prevailing concept of power as illegitimate behavior designed primarily to benefit self-interest rather than organizational goals. Occasionally we find people such as Cynthia Hardy in her book Power and Politics in Organizations who recognize that the responsible use of power is a concern to all sectors of society. Somehow, we need to marry the understanding and use of power with an appreciation of its consequences on those on the receiving end of it. Whether power takes a constructive or destructive course depends primarily on whether it occurs in a cooperative or competitive situation. When people feel united in a common effort and that they are in it together, they build up each other's power and use it to help them achieve common goals. When they feel competitive, they tend to undermine each other's confidence and power. It should not be surprising to find that severe alienation can easily lead to the generation of conditions for radical or revolutionary ways of redistributing power in an attempt to minimize what is considered to be its abuse. This analysis can lead us to the initial conclusion that power has traditionally been preoccupied with the ability to make things happen, which is essentially self-focused or ego-driven. It usually has a short-term focus, and that approach will almost inevitably be abused, corrupt, corrupting, or corrupted. On the other hand, power that is concerned with accepting a wider sense of responsibility, i.e., where it is essentially others-focused, is more likely to have a longer-term focus and to incorporate a broader consideration of all the stakeholder interests in any decision-making process. In the end, power is about making choices, and that requires a stakeholder analysis of the potential impact of those decisions on all the people involved. A responsibility-driven approach has at, as its starting point in whose interests are the changes being made. How often do we find power defined 
as the opportunity to exercise responsibility. Or as Winston Churchill once put it, the price of greatness is responsibility. The effective exercise of power requires an answer to the question, what is in the long-term interest of the organization for whom I am acting? Or society, if broader issues are involved, as opposed to just what is in my own short-term interest. There are those such as M. Marin who go on to argue the flight from personal responsibility is probably the central moral phenomenon of the late 20th century. While others emphasize the link between rights and responsibilities. When we speak of human rights, we should also speak of human responsibilities. It is no use clamoring for human rights if we are not prepared to accept our human duties. As a result, to be effective, particularly over the longer term, leadership needs to be more concerned with issues associated with responsibility rather than just with power. And this link will be emphasized further later. However, before that point is reached, it is useful con to consider some of the issues associated with the concept of responsibility. Also, it is important to recognize that a considerable amount of management literature does reflect a strong responsibility-driven theme. For example, a quote of Edward Brennan, chairman of Sears Roebuck, made a few years ago. Corporate responsibility continues to mean many things to us. It is the fair and equitable treatment of all our stakeholders, including associates, shareholders, customers, and suppliers. It is our sense of concern for all the well-being of the public at large and for our environment. And it is time and money that we contribute towards strengthening the communities where we do business that is also important. Companies cannot expect to operate an effective responsibility-driven policy unless top management sets an example and is seen to set an example. A relatively rare example of a mission or value statement that specifically highlights a responsibility-driven approach is that of Johnson & Johnson, quoted in James Champney's study of re-engineering management, who start by maintaining, we believe our first responsibility is to the doctors, nurses, and patients, to mothers and fathers, and to all others who use our products and services. They then go on to talk about their responsibilities to their employees and the community, before ending with, our final responsibility is to our stockholders. This line is also reflected in a major Royal Society of Arts report on tomorrow's company, which emphasized the importance of a stakeholder approach. The central idea of this report was that benefits arise from an inclusive company approach which valued all its stakeholders, this report concluded, there is clear evidence that companies which put their shareholders first do less well for them in the long run than those that recognize the claims of all their stakeholders. In fact, John Plender went on to argue that a failure to give due weight to important stakeholder relationships could thus constitute a failure by the directors to di discharge their duty properly. Occasionally the basic pressures for survival can result in there being no alternative but to take the risk of apparently pursuing the interests of one stakeholder at the expense of others in the short term. For example, a financial time Editorial in 1993 argued, Mr. Lou Gerstner, IBM's new chairman, is undoubtedly right to be wielding his hatchet, but this is not a sustainable way to run a company over time. 
Academic research has shown consistently that while fear may motivate in the short term, prolonged uncertainty creates a fall in employee morale and productivity which is hard to halt, let alone reverse. Many of the best employees leave while the rest are inclined to put their heads down and cease to give their all. Now many of these ideas concerning responsibility are becoming more widely recognized in the management literature. For example, Tom Cannon in his book Corporate Responsibility maintained, a society driven by responsibilities is orientated towards service, acknowledging other points of view, compromise and progress, whereas a society driven by rights is orientated towards acquisition, confrontation and advocacy. Unfortunately, others, such as Willard Galen, rightly caution us with the comment that the capaci capacity to be ruthless, driving and immoral, if also combined with intelligence and imagination, can be a winning combination in politics as well as commerce. Psychopathic and paranoid personalities are the most dangerous in people and power, precisely because those are the characteristics that are often most suitable for the attainment of power in a competitive culture such as ours. The earlier comment provides a firm warning that the path outlined is far from easy. It is also important to recognize that the contrast between the power-driven and the responsibility-driven approaches do not assume an extreme polarization only that important differences arise in organizations and individuals that are dominated by either approach. These issues lead us to the key subject of how we learn about responsibility. Again, as Charles Handy argues, we must accept our responsibilities to fellows and earn the confidence which will allow the freedoms. That is the kind of thing one learns from parents as much as from teachers. But then, the messages implicit in subsidiarity are a good guide to parenthood. Given a child, give a child as much responsibility as she or he can handle and then help them to live up to it. The conclusion at this stage is that the most effective concept of power over the long term is that which is fully integrated with the concept and the acceptance of responsibility. The connection between the two can be made by ensuring that not only is a thorough stakeholder analysis undertaken, but there are effective channels for appropriate compromises within the decision-making processes. It is only a very small step to see that these ideas of power and responsibility overlap considerably with and so needed, need to be integrated closely into the key question, what do we mean by leadership? Some power-driven individuals and organizations can be defined as successful in the short term, but both research and experiences in books such as Built to Last by Collins and Porras as well as studies such as Tomorrow's Company mentioned earlier, increasingly suggest that power-driven individuals contain the seeds of their own destruction. And this usually includes any organization they are associated with. This is based on the apparent infinite need to prove themselves or to feed their egos. Robert Maxwell being a classic example of this approach. Both power and leadership are best seen as a form of trusteeship and unless those who have power use it responsibly and are seen to use it responsibly, they will find it is taken away from them in one way or another sooner or later. The link with power was also recently made by Ketz de Varis in the final paragraph of his book, Leaders, Fools and Impostors, essays on the psychology of leadership when he mentioned those leaders who are able to combine action with reflection who have sufficient self-knowledge to recognize the vivisectitudes of power and who will not be tempted away 
when the psychological sirens that accompany power are beckoning will in the end be the most powerful. They will be the ones who are remembered with respect and affection. They will also be the ones truly able to manage the ambiguities of power and lead a creative and productive life. From the above views, it should not be too difficult to see the link with learning organization concepts. One author that saw these connections was J.A. Conger in his book, The Charismatic Leader, who effectively, who considered that effective organizations hold leaders accountable for the development of all their subordinates. And empowerment is defined as the process of enabling and motivating subordinates by increasing their personal efficacy. Thus it becomes the leader's responsibility to help each subordinate reach his or her full potential. Yet, as the Firestone CEO, John Nevin, quoted by T.A. Stewart, recognized, if you want to drive a person crazy, the easiest way to do it is to give them a deep sense of responsibility and no authority. In fact, it is precisely this imbalance that causes problems with too many empowerment programs today, as they are too often more concerned with giving people additional responsibility rather than with giving them greater authority, a classic recipe for stress. It is also valuable to recognize that the ultimate judgment of leaders is often not about how they acquire and use power, but how they relinquish it. Ultimately, this comment reflects how many politicians and chief executives have interpreted their view of power. In essence, leadership is concerned with the effective and efficient management of all the stakeholder interests and the interfaces in the long-term interests of the organization as a whole. Within this context, it is necessary to recognize the importance of the link with learning and to emphasize the increasing role of the learning organization approach. As Zuboff rightly argued in her classic study in the age of the smart machine, learning is now the new form of labor. It is no longer a separate activity that occurs either before one enters the workplace or in remote classroom settings. Learning is the heart of productive activity. This reinforces the long-held view of Red Revens that, in the long term, the only sustainable competitive advantage is the ability to learn faster and more effectively than your competitors. And that applies both to organizations and nations, as well as individuals. Consequently, the more change that's going on, the greater is the need to get the learning attitudes and structures right. And if the rate of change is greater than the rate of effective learning, there is little chance that the changes will ultimately be equated with progress. With the amount of change going on in the world today, Getting the learning processes right is a critical challenge for us all, both individually and organizationally. It is now widely recognized that continuous improvement means accepting the need for new ideas, identifying those that are relevant to the future of our organization, taking them on board, and then implementing them effectively. In order for this to happen, any organization and all the individuals in it must be able to learn effectively. One great advantage of humility is that it can be an effective foundation for learning. And conversely, complacency can often be a powerful barrier to learning. One perhaps paradoxical challenge for today's wise leader is how to avoid being complacent about one's humility. The importance of organization